Hello, everyone. My name is George Connolly. I am president and CEO of One Ledger Technology. I want to welcome you to One Ledger Talks. And today I'm joined by Murt Aktash, who is the CEO of TokenSuite. Say hello to everyone. Mert. Hello, everyone. Uh, as George said, my name is Murt. Uh, I'm the CEO of TokenSuite. Uh, and I'm just happy to be here in the second uh, episode of One Ledger Talks. Now, One Ledger Talks is a series of conversations with business leaders and One Ledger team about issues, updates, and events that are important to the blockchain business, to One Ledger in particular, and obviously to the partners that we invite. Today, one of the things we're going to talk about is what's happening in the whole space um, of the Web 2 and Web 3, how to navigate bear markets in which we've been in for a little while and we're seeing a little bit of sunlight and basically how to continue thriving in this blockchain environment. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I've been at One Ledger now for two years, just over two years, two years and four months to be exact, if you want to split hairs about it. And um, my background is primarily in technology consulting, PwC, Xerox and doing high level business consulting where we engineer solutions for clients. And um, my introduction into blockchain, I think was bloody. Um, we came in and it was a bear market. We had to uh, reorganize the business, but it's been a fun ride, amazing stuff to learn. And um, very happy to I've met people like Mert who helped me navigate this process. I'm going to let him introduce himself now. Thank you for that, George. Uh, my name is Mert, and uh, I've been in crypto since 2017. Actually, we started like uh, in a dorm room in college uh, with the founder of Token Suite, uh, one of my dearest friends, Omar. Uh, we at that time we started mining Bitcoin. At that time we learned what Bitcoin was uh, in 2014. And in 2017, after like dealing with a lot of bounty campaigns on Bitcoin talk uh, and organizing a lot of marketing campaigns for different projects, we decided to found Token Suite. Before that, we already founded like two different companies uh, doing different stuff like uh, bounty campaigns and airdrops. And as they took off, we just decided that we should have a company that is uh, that has a wider uh, spectrum of services, and at that time we found the token suite. Uh, about myself, I'm a physicist. Uh, I did my uh, masters at the University of Arizona in the U.S. Uh, and right after I graduated, I just thought I would go back to my old business and just uh, grow it. And at that time, the market was great; it was doing all right. Uh, this is like around, this is like the end of the last bull market. So almost a year ago now. <laughs> so as I said before that, I just took uh, a small break for my studies and stuff. Uh, but right now I'm back, back in business, uh, dealing with uh, many clients for, uh, for their success. And uh, I'm just happy to be doing this job. Because, because we believe, uh, in general, marketing is uh, the backbone of look, many, many crypto projects. It's, uh, it's a part that is, that is really important. I have to agree. Um, we see marketing, actually, as yeah. the most important element of crypto. Yeah. And, um, Token Suite has been formidable in this space. And, um, yeah, and for, for a long time, we've, we've been just doing this, like we've been just doing marketing. And in 2018, we also started like doing uh, software development, blockchain software development. We have a big team here uh, in Turkey uh, of 20 people, 20 developers. Uh, we started doing that as well. And as we just dived more uh, into the industry, we started liking it more. And in 2019, uh, our founder decided to found a VC arm as well. So right now we're doing marketing also as a value that we add uh, to the projects that we invested. 
That's fantastic. So we are in a bear market right now. Exactly. And um, bear no, no, market. No denial about that. <laughs> yeah, and bear markets can sometimes go on for a pretty long time. So the question is, what do you do during the bear market? Now, the, I'm going to start by saying what we have done as one ledger during the bear market. And then I'm going to ask you to comment from a general point and also as a token suite business. Exactly. Now, one of the things that we've done, a bear market gives a company time to sort of examine itself, to take a look at how do you become resilient in the future to other bear market runs. So you start to examine every single aspect of your business, how that business sort of syncs with the real world. And one of the things that we've done is that we've taken a decision to not have all of our fortunes directly linked to the, to, to the changing of a token price, but to continue to build out what we call real world applications. And these are enterprise applications that can be used um, every day. So you would have seen some time ago, we had an announcement with a, with a digital signature platform called Signature. An opportunity like that, that's the first signature, digital signature platform available that has blockchain in it. And in addition to that, um, in the roadmap that, we've, that we're gonna release today, you will see that we continue to focus on the build of our ecosystem to support effective DAP onboarding and development. So essentially what we wanna do, we wanna create a platform that developers can deploy, expand, deepen their relations with us, and be as creative as they can be in terms of building out projects on our platform. So ongoing upgrades of our platform, new development is gonna be in line with our prime directive, which is we wanna be the leaders in this industry in blockchain and interoperability. And we wanna produce applications consistently that offer real world application and use. Over to you, Matt. So uh, when I like think about bear market, I look at it. I mean, I have my own experience as a company. I know what we're doing. I know what, what we have been doing in the uh, previous bear markets. And I know that almost 100% of, uh, of our services, we developed these, we worked on these during bear markets. That's when uh, we had time to think about everything, to think about the client experience, uh, to think about some novel marketing strategies. Bear markets are when these idea, ideas just come to surface. That's what I believe. And right now that's what we're doing. But I also see uh, what our clients are doing uh, during bear markets because last year around this time, we had many clients above, above 100, and uh, right now we have, we have almost half of it. And the health uh, that is remaining now, I see what they're doing. I see that they're really building stuff. And I see uh, that one of the most important things during a bear market is to be able to see how the next bull run will be like. Let's say concepts that will be carrying the next bull, bull run. And I see that some projects are really creative. Some, some, some of the projects that we are working with, they're really building really creative products that might be really useful in the next bull run. That's, that's what I think of it when I think of the bear market. First, you have to improve your business. You have to focus on business development. And the second is you have to see and you have to be able to predict what the next bull run will be like because you have to adjust according to that. Well, that sort of vindicates the decisions that we've been making. Um, certainly, what can you do with a product, a solution or a service that makes it sort of resilient to shifts in the market? Number two, um, what is their need for? There's so much creativity in the market right now. 
that um, that it's difficult sometimes to keep pace with it, mm -hmm. but there is a product or a service or a developer out there right now who is building the next big thing. And one of the things that we want to do is that we want to be able to help them champion that DAP to get it onto a platform that can work well for them and be market resilient. Um, and you ask yourself, where is the world going in terms of DAPs that we think will make a difference? They're obviously one of the things that we see, we think CBDCs is a big deal. And we think CBDCs is a big deal because the banking system um, that has served us so well for so many years has tremendous restrictions in it. Um, I, I also see it, see it like, uh, uh, does, I also think it's gonna uh, happen eventually, like the CBDCs. I, I think we're gonna go in that direction, yeah. I think because it's, it's because it's needed. Uh, we see most of the time a lot of scams, a lot of uh, wrong <laughs> wrongdoings in crypto. Exactly. So, uh, I think I mean naturally we're gonna walk into that direction. Correct. And, and I think there's going to be a unification of all the CBDCs that you're going into one or two central players, um, where you have a construct that transactions can be done across the globe immediately, verified immediately, and settled mm -hmm. immediately. So I think that's crucial. And for that, you need you need a really like a solid uh, layer one. Exactly. Right? That is able to come absolutely. Um, so I, I think that's a part of the construct um, for the future. Another part of the future, because since the 80s and the whole globalization aspect, we have some companies that have taken that to next level. But what that has done is that it's left a lot of local companies out. But I think trade will continue to expand. And now we need a construct that able to facilitate trade. And how there is no better application I can think of for trustless transactions than blockchain. Where parties who are disparate, who are unknown to each other, can manage transactions, both the process and the payment and the logistics and all the underpinning audit trails that are required in that process than a blockchain. Um, what do you think about that? Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, these are the futures that make uh, that make a blockchain important and uh, solid. Not like, I mean, today, many uh, dApps, let's say you just developed a dApp and you wanted to launch on a network. And most of the decisions that are made right now are based on the fundings, fundings from these blockchains, right? Right. But the thing is, although uh, I don't, I don't want to like give any names here, but although a blockchain uh, might seem really big when you look at it from the marketing side, but on a technical side, it's weak. But uh, somehow they manage to uh, raise money and they're able to fund pro dApps uh, that are launching on their networks, but. As I said, on the technical side, side it's weak. So I completely agree with you. Uh, the technical features are more important here. And I think the industry will start valuing them more in the future, maybe, if, if not now. Now, another thing that has come up in our discussions with some of our clients is Industry 5.0, especially in a world where we have um, climate um, change that's rampant. And we have abuses, which are rampant as well. Mm -hmm. So we have clients who are asking us to develop applications, let's say for mining. First thing, how do you mine in a sustainable way with the permits and certificates associated with that, without obviously destroying all the ecology? Number two, how do you ensure that the staff who work at the mining firm are actually paid staff and not enslaved or in any way 
um, coerced into doing the work. Then in terms of the mines, the assets of the mines being tokenized and authorized by the government as being legally done, all this certification to do that, shipping to any type of refinement facility, and then being converted into um, bullion or blocks or whatever is required in order for it to be converted into product at the end. And as you know, cobalt, copper, and other precious metals, for lack of a better term, are key to um, some of the technology that's being yeah. created today, chips, um, processors, mobile phones, et cetera. This has now become a trillion dollar industry. And because it's become such a big industry, regulation is a critical thing. So we have clients who are talking to us about using blockchain to manage that entire process. And um, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that, even in forestry, uh, et cetera. Um, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, with the usage of like novel, uh, novel algorithms, uh, I think mining will be more responsible uh, climate-wise and also so socially. It'll be more socially responsible because it's gonna, uh, it won't be needing uh, this many resources in the future. That's what I think. So there's POS. That's fine. Uh, I mean, people already started developing solutions to this, uh, but I think mining in the future will also be as harmless as as proof of stake. Uh, okay. <laughs> as, as as the proof of stake framework. That's that's what I believe because uh, for like small uh, applications, let's say I want to make use of blockchain, I just want to utilize it and. I go to a company and uh, that is providing blockchain as a service. And uh, I just wanna deploy all of my database into one blockchain using this company's service. For that, I don't think uh, like a, uh, a streamlined harmless mining system. I don't, I don't think uh, like, I don't see any way that that wouldn't be useful. I think mining will still be uh, utilized in the future in, in such applications, especially for blockchain as a service applications. Okay. And it, it'll, be, it'll be more responsible. It'll be, I mean, that is, that is in inevitable, I think. I am hoping so. People I'm think, hoping people so. think it's harmful. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, George. People think it's, it's harmful and it's dangerous because, uh, because the way Bitcoin works, but not all uh, mining-based uh, blockchains, not all of them are like Bitcoin, right? You can just basically, okay. let's say, expand your block size and make it less, uh, let's say, congested, make the work less congested, make, make the network less congested and stuff. So there are a lot of solutions, that's what I mean. Absolutely, I mean, and um, downstream manufacturing companies, in the electronics and the automotive and the automotive area, they're increasingly demanding or being compelled by the um, countries in which they work to have the upstream individuals, the producers, with regards to the metals and the materials on their end, to provide information of provenance that we spoke about earlier, where the mines are, who are they mined by and the metals that are contained in each of the products, and then the conditions under which they're produced, and are they produced responsibly. And if they're not, a lot of them are being forced not to trade with them. So if you can't verify this information as a supplier, um, it's simply not feasible in order for them to do business with you because they'll be sanctioned by the countries that they work for or won't be able to sell products into certain countries. So um, it's, it's, it's a welcome development and it's something that I'm glad that we can be a part of. And I think some of the developers in the space now 
should start taking a look at these kind of applications because this will be a new frontier. Exactly. And I'm, I'm always in favor of such uh, regulations that can uh, favor such development. And I think most many of the DAP developers, they, they, think, they think about this stuff. They started thinking about this stuff like uh, when, when they're deciding on uh, the network that they're going to launch on and stuff. Uh, they they started having a more like comprehensive look uh, at the network because, as you said, people are uh, right now becoming more and more responsible about what they're doing. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about transactions, my mind always swings to decentralized exchanges, mm -hmm. and um, and this is AMM um, decentralized exchanges that work almost autonomously. Now you've seen a lot of these and um, we have built with a partner, our own platform called Mumba Dex with EMS, a marketing company. And we are about to make some changes in that space that developers would find very exciting where we've incorporated other DEXs into the platform that then allow for being able to exchange hundreds of tokens. Um, so everything that Polygon has to offer, everything that PancakeSwap has to offer, Uniswap and QuickSwap um, is available, is gonna be available on that chain very soon. And then you've got transactional items in the real world. Um, give me your thoughts on what you see as the future of development for decentralized exchanges and the role that they can play in terms of the enterprise market space and building that up. Sure. So uh, we've had a lot of tax clients and right now, uh, I think AshSwap and Starfish. Starfish is building a stable swap uh, platform on Polkadot and the other uh, AshSwap is doing the same for uh, the Elrond network. So uh, right now, DEXs are like, they're native to, to the blockchain that they're uh, working on. Yeah. And I've, I'm seeing a trend right now, like for all the swaps uh, and for all the like order book based DEXs, there are some uh, people trying to make this cross chain, which might be, the new thing, the the new uh, like paradigm for for DEXs. That's what I'm thinking. It is really it's difficult. Casual. Yeah, it is. It, it is really difficult. It is really. Uh, it takes a lot of work to do that for for most chains for and to bring all of the chains together and build uh, one swap platform or one DEX for for all of them. It is difficult, but I see some people are trying to do this, and I think that might be the future for DEXs and. Today, I think like most of the on-chain transactions, these are happening on DEXs and, and swap platforms. So uh, at the end of the day, the DEX that is, uh, that is deployed on the blockchain that is uh, best in handling all of these transactions, I think that DEX will survive at the end of the day. And if it's if it's a cross chain one, it's gonna be great. That's what I think. Okay. You know, we use a lot of terms sometimes, and there's a big difference between our our understanding of it and how a layman or someone not in the industry might. And exactly. one of the things that we use is web two versus web three. Mm -hmm. So, um, give me your definition of Web3 versus Web2. Sure. So, uh, I can't even like start from uh, an earlier point. We kept saying DAP, DAP and stuff. So, what is a DAP, right? <laughs> yeah. So, because right now we have apps. Uh, we, right now we have apps that are on our uh, phones, like Facebook, Instagram. And sure. These are uh, all of the, uh, let's say, transaction, like liking, liking a, a photo on, uh, on Instagram is basically a transaction crypto, right? 
So you like it and it gets processed in Facebook servers. So it is centralized. All right. So what makes blockchain different here is that blockchain is distributed. I mean, people call it decentralized, but at first, uh, at first point, it's distributed. It is. Uh, it consists of a lot of nodes that are being run on different people's computers or just big, big like mining farms. Uh, so it is. A, it is the, like through the definition of a distributed network, and here people uh, they keep making transactions and. The validity of these transactions, I'm just uh, talking about this for, as we said, for the layman, uh, the validity, validity of these transactions are, uh, are assured by these nodes by making some, some type of computations, by solving some right. uh, mathematical problems computationally. So you're already like for, for, for just verifying transactions, you're already spending a lot of computation power. And uh, like maybe it's more than 10 years ago now, uh, the founder of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, he just thought, why, why don't we use this computational power that is being spent for just verifying the transactions to run decentralized apps, right? Because there's already like computations going on and you can just attach a piece of code to to the transaction and you can just run that code in, in someone else's computer. That is uh, what we mean by distribu distributed network. So he just invented smart contracts and in a smart contract, you write the code for your dApp and that code is run in someone else's computer in different Ethereum nodes or, or Bitcoin nodes. For right. Bitcoin, there's also such applications like Lightning Network. So. This is what makes it different from Facebook. Facebook is run on Facebook servers and all of your data goes to one place. But for that, it is uh, distributed. It is publicly available. Your code is publicly available. Uh, if you want to update it, you just deploy a new smart contract. You cannot change the smart contract that you deployed uh, at some point in the past, uh, which is good or bad. I, I will also talk about that. Uh, so yeah, this is basically what a DAP is. It is an application that is run on, that, that is run on many people's computers, so it's not connected to one central authority, and you are able to see every detail about it uh, on like uh, websites that we call uh, blockchain explorers. So uh, and as you asked about the differences between Web two and Web three. This is what Web3 is basically. In Web3, we will see more blockchain applications. We will see more connect wallet buttons on the right corner of websites. We already started seeing that. I think a few days ago, Reddit and Polygon, they made a partnership. And right now, 3 million Redditors, they, uh, they, they got themselves uh, Polygon wallets uh, okay. yeah, for, for some NFTs on Reddit. So it is uh, blockchain and crypto uh, applications. They will be uh, a solid part of Web3, but also some people define Web3 as uh, blockchain plus AI, like AI applications as well. Right. Uh, so we will see more of that in the future uh, in Web3. And what, what Web2 is, uh, I think there's an analogy in between uh, Web One and Web Two, and Web Two and Web Three, like because Web One was static, right? There was uh, there were no like dynamic pages. Everything was static. There was just uh, still images, um, not moving at all. And uh, in Web Two, we started seeing more like cool stuff, uh, stuff that are moving, videos uh, like Flash, Flash on different uh, browsers, Adobe Flash. And in Web3, it'll be uh, it'll be like even more dynamic, and it'll be the same thing without decentralized servers. I mean, there are projects for decentralizing internet, like all at once. Uh, 
some of the like uh, applications uh, right now are the Brave web browser. I mean, they're not decentralizing the, the internet, but at least they're decentralizing the browser experience. Because right now I'm, uh, let's say, opening Google Chrome on my computer and I see some ads and Google makes money from those ads just because I see them. And right. they're, they're making use of my personal data uh, to customize those ads. And basically, I'm giving out my personal data for free, and they're making money out of it. And Correct. The, and the Brave web, web browser, which is like adopted right now for uh, by many uh, people in crypto, uh, you just sell your own personal data, and you get the money for it. You, you get you get a Brave token. So this is like decentralized web browser. It is a perfect application of Web3. Uh, I'm sure they're using some uh, artificial intelligence applications there as well to customize the ads and stuff. Uh, but yeah, basically Web3, just in one sentence, there will be more connect wallet buttons in the, in the web applications that we use today. Even, even in the Time Magazine, they, they, de uh, they developed a new subscription model now. In Web3? Yeah, in Web3. Uh, there's a page uh, on Time Magazine's uh, website, uh, which is like on the right uh, upper corner, you have the connect wallet button and you connect your wallet. And if you have the Time Magazine subscription NFT in your wallet, you have access to some exclusive articles, which is just a great okay. application. Yeah. So in summary, Web2 is centralized platforms exactly controlled by single users who then mine the data and use it for their own needs so let me talk about fine that's the group that we talk about facebook etc cetera, etc cetera. and um then in a web3 environment it's completely decentralized completely that's Peer the one side of things decentralized, Peer -peer decentralized. Transaction. so we've exactly. taken the guy out of the middle who controls the whole platform. Exactly. Um, so. And in that it's, too? Uh, it's, sorry, it's, 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 it's the future and they're gonna see that expanded. Huge difference, and, yeah. Um, and I think that's why sometimes there is a resistance to Web3 applications because it upsets the Apple cart in terms of revenue derived, particularly from data, all right? Which drives everything. Exactly. So, but that's why, that's why like many, many big heads right thing now came out of this. NCAA, which is one of the biggest businesses that's not a business in the world, um, over a hundred billion dollars a year in NCAA web revenue, and this is on the backs of American students who compete in collegiate sports and it's broadcast and held at stadiums, et cetera. And for years, these students have not been able to benefit in any way from the contributions that they've made to sports entertainment until last year, where it started in California, name, image, and likeness platform. And it's the same thing. Same so, thing, same thing. Yeah. So I now for, 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 for Anytime their name, image, or likeness is used in any type of social media platform, it's flagged and they're compensated for it. And then direct advertising, et cetera. So yeah. to your point, it's the exact same thing where Web3 makes a critical difference in yeah. being able to manage information and then be compensated for it. Yeah, I mean, let's say I'm an artist and uh, I do a show and I sell tickets and why do I? Why don't I just tell it to the audience itself? Why there is a company in the middle, like, right. like, like Ticketmaster, that is handling that for me? Why and making making uh, most of the money? That's right. With blockchain, you can just sell it to the audience, and you can do it on that. That's it. So that's what I think. So you, you that's, that's, know, that's why I suggest our the audience part. that they shouldn't believe anyone that are uh, that are trying to undermine the potential. Of, uh, of blockchain. Absolutely. There's a Chinese artist now who's actually selling NFTs and then he burns 
the original art. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you know that you have the only copy now. Exactly. <laughs> so fantastic stuff. I mean, when nope. it comes to applications of blockchain, there is like million things to talk about. So if we just keep absolutely going to take place. Now, you know? one of the things you said earlier was about dApps, and really it's an application, obviously, like applications on a mobile phone. Um, so a layer one platform is essentially like either Android or Apple. Exactly. And then the developers develop their, their applications. And because they're on a decentralized platform, we then call it dApps instead of apps. But it's basically the same thing, applications that run on a decentralized platform. So let's talk about um, a marketing approach for a dApp, which is your real area of expertise. Um, we've, we've seen some products like um, Shiba or Dogecoin that are just meme coins and really have nothing behind them but a marketing concept and have become successful in inverted commas based on that. So let's talk about marketing approaches to dApps. And what do you think is the best way to have a successful marketing campaign for a dApp? What do you need? So uh, since you talked about like Shiba and, and Doge coins, I think Doge is doing some cool things right now. But uh, in the past, like when they have nothing uh, beneath the surface, uh, <laughs> so there is a toxic side uh, of crypto right now. People, uh, I mean, it, it is speculative, right? Uh, and people are trying to make money out of the tokens of the, these new DApps that are. Uh, that are launching. So since many of the DAP uh, developers, many of the CEOs in the space, since they know this, they're trying to create a marketing plan that is centered around the price. So I don't see it as a healthy way to go for crypto. And I think this is going to diminish in time. But for if I mean, if you want to reach the masses, many of the leaders in the space right now see it as one of the best options. Like talk about the price, sell people hope, and tell them that the price is going to increase and increase and increase. So that might be one marketing option for many of the. Uh, well, some of us can't. Yeah, we can do that. We can no, some, of us, some of us can do that, uh, but it is a way that is preferred by many uh, uh, project leaders, and it it makes me upset actually because okay, okay, makes because, me upset too because I can't. Yeah, do it. <laughs> I don't think it. Uh, I don't see it as sustainable. I mean, people will not fall into uh, these uh, from a few years from now. Uh, a few years from now, and I think uh, a better and a more healthy, like healthier uh, way for marketing is to just grow organic communities, right? You should grow organic communities. You should ignite people's interest. You should tell people why your project is going to change things. And that, that requires a lot of effort. And I know it from uh, from many of the project managers in our company. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to build a narrative uh, for a project that is really going to change things. That's 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 one thing too. Because when we start, uh, when before we start working with a client, we just analyze it. If they're really doing something, if if blockchain really needs that project, right? And if we are uh, satisfied with all the answers, we just start working with uh, the client and we build the best narrative. You have to build the best narrative and you have to spread it to communities and you have to grow these communities organically. Uh, and you have to do this in different regions because blockchain right now is global. It's not just English. It's just right. not, uh, it's, it's not just European languages. You have to do this in many, many languages, 
That's why we are working in 14 different languages. We are trying to cover all of the world uh, because you never know like where people show interest to, to blockchain. For example, in Philippines, it's, it's the country that is, uh, that is the first on the lists of like GameFi projects. Okay. They love they love game five projects and they they play games and they 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 love play to earn games they they want to make money just from playing games uh, and for example in Turkey people see uh, crypto as uh, as an escape from like high inflation rates in Vietnam uh, in in Venezuela as well. Okay. So you never know where people will show interest in crypto. So you have to build a narrative and you have to push that narrative in many languages so that uh, people realize the potential of the project and they just take part. They just uh, decide to invest. I mean, if you ask a traditional investor like Warren Buffett, right? If you ask him, I mean, I've seen a lot of interviews of him. Uh, if you ask them like how to invest in a stock, right? What they say is find a company that you uh, that has a potential that you think has a potential that you trust that you trust, and then invest. I think the same thing will happen in crypto. You have to trust the company first. You have to trust the developers of the company first of the project first, and you have to believe yourself that. The project has a potential they're going to do something they're going to change things so after that you invest you you just you you do not you do not just invest because some influencer on youtube said the price will double in one week right and for that as i said a really great narrative is much needed for uh for a marketing strategy that lives longer so I mean, basically what you're saying is that there is no secret sauce there's no secret sauce there's no there's no secret sauce it's like uh you know the guy in ancient greek he just says uh no one that doesn't know geometry cannot enter to the school and the king comes and says uh, isn't there a shortcut a shortcut and he says there's no shortcut to success right there's no right. shortcut to success and uh what we do is as i said build really uh, comprehensive narratives that, that are able to live longer than simple marketing strategies. I mean, we have clients that we've been working with since 2017. We're still working with them and we're still uh, adding and subtract, subtracting from the narrative, but we are just keeping it because uh, we believe in it and many of the followers of the project Many of the people in their communities, they believe in the project and they're like uh, good supporters of the project. I found it amazing that you said you now operate in 14 languages. Yeah. Uh, that speaks to the global, um, the global presence of blockchain. I mean, you have to in know. In our business, we, um, we have one business development manager in Africa. He's in Nigeria, and he focuses on his team for the entire African region. And then we have another chap in Hong Kong who focuses on Macau, Singapore, et cetera. That's and so, um, so what you're saying to me now is that we need to build that team up considerably <laughs> in order to have a greater impact. So that's something we need to have a discussion about, the, the language factor and the um, incursion into different markets something something for us to think about a lot more i mean we've done a lot of stuff in english of course but obviously spanish speakers french speakers um mea um so a lot to think about thanks for that there's a lot to think about that yeah because uh i'm a turkish citizen and i lived in the u.s for a short time like two years and right now I know like many Indonesian people, many Nigerian people, just because of my job. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I, uh, 
not reasons but like why I love my job because I get to know many people from around the world that are interested in the same thing that I'm interested in. Fantastic. Now, the future. The future is here. Yeah. You know, a little while ago, I wrote um, a tweet or a comment on LinkedIn that blockchain is the future. So blockchain is here and the future is here. But we spoke a bit about Industry 5.0 and how we talk about having sustainable businesses, et cetera. Now, the concept that I see in the future is really dynamic. Um, right now, we hire staff from anywhere in the world, no matter um, the jurisdiction. The only thing is the language and sometimes the time zones that would influence staff and decisions. Um, but we seek out the best talent, no matter where they are in the world. And we have a remote working environment now that has become the norm, or rather a hybrid environment that has become the norm. I don't think that genie is going back in the bottle. So I think that the world will continue to use talent wherever they are as effectively as they can anywhere that they're placed. Um, that's not going to change. And in that space, one of the things that we've done is that we've developed a, an HR platform this called Genie, just by coincidence, but it's spelled D-G-I-N-N-I. -N -N -I, that's going to be used to sort of manage, promote, highlight, et cetera, this whole global inclusiveness in the workforce. That's number one. Number two, we spoke about CBDCs. We think fiat, the crypto movement across the world is gonna continue apace. There is $80 trillion in global trade every year. And obviously there is money to be made there in transactional fees and arbitrage, et cetera. And the only way that that becomes viable is if you do volume. So we think that's a good space to play in as well. We think auditability across applications is something that blockchain will play a crucial role in, particularly logistics and any financial transactions. That's a space that we want to be in as well. And obviously, we want to work with DAP partners, with application partners in all of these spaces. And we want to be global and we want to be progressive. So these are some of the areas that we're looking at right now. And then obviously the industry 5.0 is a critical thing for us where we can add value in that space as we're doing now with this partner that we are about to embark on a journey on. So tell me what you think the future is gonna be like and how Token Suite will make a difference in that space. So there's no single doubt in my head right now that blockchain is going to be the future. It is, it is going to be the future, but in, in what shape or in what form is right now unknown. And I think it is it is really one of the uh, like biggest problems to solve right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You cannot predict it because will there be one blockchain or will there be many blockchains? Sure. Uh, right. There should be many blockchains maybe because uh, by the nature, this is something decentralized and there should be like many people doing the same thing. And will CBDCs be more common? I think so. I think they'll be more common in the future. I mean, I don't think the indus industry has an eventual point that it's walking towards. I think it's gonna always evolve because uh, yeah. this is like something that is purely decentralized. So it is, it is always going to evolve. I don't think there's a final point for all of us to, uh, to imagine. And I don't think we should feel like obliged to feel, uh, to feel that way. Uh, I think it's always going to evolve. And I think the frequency of these bear markets will decrease in the future because 
uh, people will start uh, realizing the value, realizing the potential of blockchain, and investors will be able to uh, invest their monies uh, in a more like comfortable way. They won't be hesitated because right now, uh, I think when we were just talking one-to-one uh, -one about this, uh, right now a developer, a bright developer in Silicon Valley, some of them are thinking of like quitting their jobs and starting uh, a Web3 company. Some of them are doing this, but not all of them are doing this and not, right. not the brightest ones are doing this. And as soon as the smart money starts flowing into the ecosystem, and as soon as this, these people with potential start doing work on blockchain, I think from that point on, it is gonna be like a truck with no brakes going downhill. <laughs> I mean, downhill is, is, is not a good analogy, but it is not gonna be stoppable after that point. That's what I think. So we have to break that point. I don't know when that, that's gonna happen. I don't know how it's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen because uh, blockchain offers many, many solutions to the problems that we're facing today. So it is gonna happen eventually. And after that point, it's just, uh, if I say it's gonna be like this, it's just gonna be fantasy. We will see. All right, thank you very much, Mert. Thank you, George, for having me. You're welcome. That's it, folks. I am George Connolly, and um, I have been sitting here with Mert Aktash, and this has been another episode of one Ledger Talks. It's a pleasure Thank to be you. here. Thank you. Us.